Hello and welcome to Spencer's Library. I'm Claudia and this is my Brexit Day vlog. It is Friday the 31st of January, just before one o'clock and in 10 hours time the UK will have officially left the European Union. Of course there's still a transition period to go through so nothing is going to change straight away but it is a symbolic day, it is the beginning of a new era for the United Kingdom and I'm not here for it. So here is my disclaimer right at the beginning of this video. This video might not be for you. If you are a trigger happy Brexiteer, if you're already typing your comments, just don't bother. I'm probably going to delete it. If you are someone who thinks that I should stick to making videos about books and not talk about politics, just skip it. I'm sure there'll be a book video soon. If you are a xenophobe telling me to get out of the country, congratulations, you've won. But please don't comment. Today I am trying really hard to celebrate the Europeanness in myself and in my life. And I'm trying not to get too beat down by this symbolic day. On the other hand, I don't want to pretend that this is a happy occasion for me because it simply isn't. And throughout this video, as I take you through my afternoon and my evening, I'll tell you what the European Union means to me and how it has impacted my life. This is about how the European Union affects real people living in the UK and living in, as of now, the rest of the European Union. But let me start my afternoon by talking to you about my family's history with the European Union while painting my nails. And of course, what other colour could I go for today than a European blue? This is from the Dutch brand Essence and the colour is called 31 Electrique. So, the question of where I'm actually from comes up a lot both in my real life and in my videos and since I talk about being Italian and since I talk about being German kind of interchangeably and I talk about both identities people often assume that I'm half Italian and half Germany but that is in fact not the case I am genetically 100% Italian and my lived experience is 100% German. I know it's, uh, it's hard to imagine for some people but immigration is a thing and in the 1980s my parents, who are both from South Italy, from uh, the Calabria region, they both moved to South Germany and a few years later happy little baby Claudia was born. I have lived my whole life in Germany up until the age of 23 when I moved to Britain and that means that in Germany I have well first of all I was born there I grew up there and I lived my entire life there except for those few weeks in the summer where we would go and visit my Italian grandparents and aunts and uncles. So when I get asked the question about whether I feel Italian or German, the answer is simply both. And that's difficult to understand for people who are, let's just call them monocultural, even though that makes them sound like some sort of bacteria. People whose lives have always been in the same place and that same place is also where their parents have come from and their grandparents and their great-grandparents and who feel a more or less strong connection to the place that they lived and to the place that their families come from because both are one in the same country. Take for example my husband Bill. He uh, was born in England and his parents are both from England from different parts of England but still from England and his grandparents are all from England and it probably goes back further than that so no one would ask him where are you really from but for second generation immigrants like me it's a little bit harder to explain how you can be 100% Italian 
and 100% German at the same time. My mum taught me how to make pizzas uh, and lasagna and pasta al forno and pasta ceci and pasta and everything. Honestly, pasta and everything. Except chicken, that's a weird thing that the British people do, that Italians don't really do. So she taught me how to cook Italian food because that's what she grew up with, because that's what her mother taught her. And at the same time, I learned to cook amazing German cakes, Schwarzwälder Kirschtorte, anyone? And I learned to uh, enjoy sauerkraut. And I mean, honestly, sauerkraut is one of my favorite foods and you literally cannot get more German than that. And, and none of this is in any way paradoxical or strange, except in the minds of people who haven't had that rich experience of growing up in two different cultures. So the entire way that I grew up has, was only possible because of the European Union, because of freedom of movement. And I know this, people typing into the comment section right now, well, you could have moved without, your parents could have moved without uh, the European Union. No, they bloody couldn't. If there had been immigration uh, limitations, like what Britain is trying to introduce now after Brexit, my mum would never have been allowed to move to Germany. In Italy, she was a qualified nursery teacher. In fact, just before she moved, she had her own nursery. She was a, a business owner. When she moved to Germany, those qualifications uh, were not accepted and she had to actually redo her nursery teacher training. When she moved to Germany, she didn't speak a word of German and now you could not tell that she is not a native German speaker. Throughout her life in Germany, my mum has paid her taxes and she's contributed to the community. And as a nursery teacher, she has raised two generations of German children, as well as immigrant children. And hundreds and hundreds of children in my hometown remember her as a nursery teacher. And hundreds and hundreds of children remember her as a nursery teacher who was Italian. Imagine if she hadn't been allowed to move to Germany and all of these German kids would only have been exposed to German teachers. That's the sort of culture that I fear that Britain is getting itself into by shutting off the borders to low trained or what they consider low trained and underqualified and low skilled and all of these horrible words that are used to describe basically people without degrees that make a huge contribution to the economy and to the community and Britain wants none of that now which is very sad. Back to my European sob story. I graduated high school and I started university in Germany and I went to London on a holiday and came back with an English boyfriend, as you do. My love of the UK, if you want to call it that, was very heavily influenced by watching Doctor Who as a 16 year old. And it's such a quirky show that I can't imagine ever being produced either on German or Italian television. It is quintessentially British. I still love it to this day. And it's shaped my own opinion of the United Kingdom. Um, unfortunately, my English boyfriend wasn't an actual time traveler. Big disappointment. But we got on all right. And after being long distance for a couple of years, he decided to move to Germany. At the time I was away at university, so I wasn't living in my hometown. And one day on a visit, he went and had a chat with the local uh, language school in my hometown, where they promptly offered him a job and told him that he needs to start next week. So he flew back to England packed up a suitcase and moved in with my parents. In fact, he moved into my childhood bedroom since I was away at university. Now that would never have been possible without the European Union and 100% I can promise you that if we had remained purely long distance until one of us was rich enough to move to the other's country, we would not be married today. Things at my university didn't go well and I quit after three painful years 
I didn't want to quit academia altogether, so I was looking to move to a different university. And I thought, we've been in Germany for a couple of years now, let's move to the UK. I applied to universities and I got accepted at the university where I'm at now, in Wales. So we moved to Wales. Freedom of movement is exactly that. It means that you can go and settle wherever you like. You can try out different countries. You can go to a place and if it doesn't work out, then you can go somewhere else. You can have relationships, real meaningful long-term relationships with people who are not in your own country because you don't have to bother with visas, you don't have to bother with entry requirements, you don't have to worry about any of that. You can just go and live somewhere else. And one thing that always bothered me about the political narrative in Britain is this idea that people, and by people they mean foreigners, are coming here, taking our jobs and stealing our benefits and our school places. Whereas that is just a false idea. First of all, you can't move here and get on benefits, even within the European freedom of movement rules. Um, you, you have to live here, I believe, for six months before you can actually apply for benefits. Uh, you are more likely to actually contribute to school places by paying taxes and contributing to the economy than taking school places from British children. And it has long bothered me that these kinds of narratives tend to go unchallenged. Freedom of movement is a fantastic idea and I'm going to use the last year of that, which is the time between the 1st of February tomorrow and the 31st of December, I'm going to use those last 11 months that freedom of movement exists to move myself and my husband and my cats back to Germany away from this country that is shutting itself off from the rest of the world and the rest of the continent. And in a way, I'm the privileged one here because I've got my little burgundy European passport. I've got my free ticket to 27 countries. Um, but people that don't have that, people that are stuck with their soon-to-be blue passports, I do feel bad for them. And I especially feel bad for their children. If I think about my little nephew, who's only just three years old now, and of the fact that he is going to be stuck on this, frankly, insignificant little island based on a decision that he didn't make. If I think of the fact that he's going to grow up in a culture that shuts itself off from the world, it, it makes me really sad and uh, I am glad that I don't have children and I am glad that I can get away from it. The British have a very strange mentality about the European Union and they have a very strange mentality about the continent of Europe because they don't consider themselves to be part of it despite all the geographical evidence to the contrary. It was so strange to me when I first moved to Wales, and this was before even the Brexit referendum, and people just said Europe like it's a different place. You know, going to Europe, or this is very European. They didn't mean Europe including Britain, they meant Europe as other than Britain. And that is a way that I haven't heard Germans talk about Europe. When Germans say Europe and European, it always includes themselves. In Britain, it never does. And I think that small quirk of language shows a lot about how the British have always seen themselves, not as part of Europe, not as outside of Europe, but in a way as above Europe. Uh, the European Union famously, I mean, I know there are lots and lots of problems with it, but famously conceived as a confederation of equals. And I think that's exactly what bothered uh, the, the British, because they don't want to be equals with countries that they consider themselves better than. Okay, my nails are done now. Nice, bright European blue. 
I am nowhere near talented enough to uh, do stars as much as I'd like to. So I'm going to take a moment away. I think I think that's going to be a theme for today that I will just be kind of popping in to talk to you about what's going on in my mind. But right now I, I need to take a break. I'm going to turn the camera off and I'm going to put some YouTube on. And then we'll see you in a bit. It's lasagna time! So I am making a lasagna for some guests that are coming over for dinner tomorrow and I am using my family recipe. Don't worry, I will tell you all the secrets about it now. And I think the number one secret for an amazing lasagna from scratch is to make it the day before you intend to eat it. I'm having people over tomorrow evening and I'm making the lasagna this afternoon. I have the four main ingredients here, of course all made from scratch. The most important ingredient in my opinion is the bechamel sauce, which you can see here. I made that one earlier today and people are afraid of making a bechamel sauce and so they should. But the trick to make a good bechamel sauce is to not panic and keep stirring. If you do that you'll be fine. Then second ingredient, let's go through them in order, is the lasagna sheets. To my mum's outrage it's just Asda store brand lasagna sheets. Then I've got the bolognese sauce and because I am doing this uh, after the family recipe this is a meat sauce using pork and beef but you could very easily make this veggie by not using any meat or by using a, a plant-based what's it called mince a plant-based mince. I personally really like the Morrison's own brand frozen vegan mince. And then finally, and this is this is where I am very much diverging from the from the family recipe. Uh, the cheese that I am using is not in fact parmesan as it should be, but cheddar because I am cheap. And bechamel is my favorite part of a lasagna, so I am very generous with it. I always make a lot. I make a big saucepan full using about two and a half liters of milk, and uh, oh, it's just. It's just what makes the lasagna such a special pasta dish. There you go, swirl it around. So the bottom layer is bechamel, the top layer is bechamel, none of cheese, none of that cheese on top things that the British are so fond of. On top of the bechamel we put the pasta and you can break the lasagna sheets if they don't quite fit. Oh my, wow. Maybe show stuck to barilla, huh? at least they break clean pasta. Then bolognese. So I really hope my mother isn't watching me sprinkle cheddar over this, but like I said, Parmesan is really expensive and you do need large quantities of it to make a decent lasagna. So the Parmesan, well in this case the cheddar, goes on top of the bolognese and then it looks like this. And then we finish off with bechamel and that's layer one done. Let's see how many layers we can get in there. In my family, lasagna has always been a celebration food. Um, we eat it at Christmas, birthdays, anytime there's anything to celebrate, anytime there's a family holiday or there's people over for a dinner party, that's when the lasagna comes out. Sometimes just on a Sunday if you feel like it. But I'd like to know, especially if there are any other um, Italians watching, is that the same in your family or is it just my family? Ooh, I found a bay leaf, we don't want to keep that in. So this lasagna that I'm making, it's going to come out a bit different maybe than what you're used to it if you have ever had lasagna in Britain. I can't really speak for what how lasagna is served in other countries, but in Britain it usually comes covered in tomato sauce and, and the tomato is kind of the prevailing, prevailing is that a word? The, the, most intense flavor of the dish and it's generally very wet it's almost like a stew or a soup but the way that i have learned to make lasagna makes a much creamier and at the same time more dry dish so it's not dripping the the pasta sheets absorb the sauce and absorb the flavor of it without 
making it super super wet and super soupy okay just finishing off the second layer hope you've remembered the sequence it goes bechamel pasta bolognese cheese and ending on bechamel okay final layer of bolognese so we can dump that all on there okay so this is what it looks like now and it's getting a bit heavy so now we just top it off with the final layer which is bechamel that's right no cheese on top there we go, slightly thin top layer of bechamel there. You can still see the cheese and the um, bolognese sauce peeking through, but just didn't get the right amount in the end. Anyway, this is going in the oven now for, I don't really know, honestly, I just like, I, I, I'm gonna check after half an hour and then if it looks done, I'll take it out. And if not, I'll leave it in for longer. Uh, I don't really time these things. I've been making this dish for 20 years now. I'm very comfortable with it. So, sorry, this isn't very helpful if you actually want to make a lasagna yourself. Well, that's cheered me up a bit anyway. I'm really looking forward to having some people over tomorrow and eating some good food and enjoying a bit of, a bit of my home. The lasagna turned out great, by the way. I'll insert a picture if I remember to take one. The thing I find so shocking about Brexit is that the British people have essentially voted to give themselves fewer rights than they had before. From tomorrow, people holding a British passport will have fewer rights than they have today. And that sort of taking away of rights doesn't normally happen via democratic vote. It normally happens if you have a foreign force invading, if there is a war, if there's a hostile takeover. And yet, this is self-inflicted. Self-inflicted curbing of your own freedoms. Which doesn't make any sense. And I'm still struggling to understand why this is the decision that the people have made. And I know that it wasn't the people, because it was 52% of the electorate. Rehashing those arguments just just doesn't sound right to me, because for years now I and people around me have talked about Brexit and have discussed it and have argued about it, both online and offline, and I'm just tired of it. All of this kind of political exhaustion has led me to be really quite excited to leave this country. And I was talking to friends about what I'm actually going to miss from my life in the UK. The number one thing I'm going to miss is the people around me. I have made some fantastic friends here in Wales and I'm going to miss them so much. I am going to find it very hard to not be around them all of the time. That is the biggest regret of leaving this country. But beyond that there isn't much. I'll miss charity shops. I'll miss cider. That's, that's it. Charity shops and cider. It was never my plan to stay in the UK long term. My husband and I always knew that we wanted to end up in Germany. Because even before Brexit, Germany just felt like a safer, more prosperous country with a better quality of life and a more stable government system. But now there really is no question. If Brexit hadn't happened, then we'd probably stay here until I finish my PhD and then maybe start a career here and then eventually move to Germany. So Brexit hasn't taken the choice from us, but it has changed the timeline. I'm not ungrateful for that. I am really quite excited to move back to my home country. For us it's not going to be too bad because we'll be in a place where we wanted to be just a little bit sooner than we wanted to be there and I just hope that he'll be able to legally get a permanent residency. Um, he's talking about applying for German citizenship which is going to be tricky 
if if that's what he wants, then I'm sure there is a way eventually. I think it's kind of shitty that he has to give up his own country's citizenship to live in the EU. But again, that's just being taken away from him. The freedom of living in Germany with a British passport is taken away from him. Hey, remember when this was a booktube channel? So I'm going to do a bit of reading to at least pretend that this is vaguely related to books. And I have picked out a book that I bought in Germany. This is called Exit Brexit, Wie ich Deutsche wurde, which means How I Became a German by Kate Connolly. And this book is written in English, but translated into German. And from what I understand, only published in Germany. So you can't actually get this in the original English language version. But it is the story of a British journalist, Kate Connolly, who moved to Berlin. So this is her memoir and uh, it, it advertises on the back that with typically British dry humour she uh, talks about her experience of moving to Germany. This sounds like it could be a little bit more of a light-hearted take on the whole thing which I honestly desperately need right now. So I'm going to read this while drinking some proper British tea. Is this a thing I want to miss in Germany? You know, Germany actually has decent tea, but you have to go loose leaf. Don't get German tea bags. Beetle's come to join me. Hello, Beetle. What do you think? What do you think of Brexit? You have no idea, do you? Because you're a stupid little cat. It's a really good book so far. It's not as hilarious as I was hoping for, but maybe that's just my mood today. Maybe there's just no making me laugh today. The author talks a lot about her experience of um, being a Brit in Germany after the Brexit vote and the sort of questions that she got. And I, I think I know what she means because I know that Bill got a lot of those questions after the Brexit referendum. And I did as well whenever I was in Germany because people in Germany just could not understand how this absolutely ridiculous idea of leaving the European Union even even was entertained by the Brits and then made a reality. And yet here it is happening and it's hard to explain to Germans how exactly it happened. And of course it's a mix of different things like a, a lack of understanding of political systems, both the British political system and the European political system, a lack of uh, seeing beyond your own boundaries, partly to do with Brits not really learning foreign languages in school um, or not learning about history of other countries. Um, I mean, ba they barely learn their own history uh, beyond the kings and queens and the glorious days of the British Empire. And then they also learn how the British won World War II like it was a football game. It's just, there's just a lot of knowledge missing in the British population. And that is, of course, entirely deliberate because the people who set the curriculum are the people who are most interested in making sure that the population doesn't know about how the system works, which really sucks. And I think it's going to be easier for those same politicians to keep... I don't want to use the word brainwashing, it seems a bit strong, but you know what I mean, to keep influencing the population through education and through the media. It's going to be so much easier for them to do that now that Britain has been taken out of the European Union because that divide between Britain and the rest of the world is just going to grow larger and larger and it's going to be a divide that's going to be much harder to bridge for future generations than it was for this generation. Right, I'm here with husband and Brit Bill and it's four hours to Brexit. Brit Bill. <laughs> How do you feel? Um, fine. You do? Oh, I've been talking a lot about identity today and that's something that is a bit different with the both of us because your identity is pretty straightforward. I'm Bill. Yes. Whereas my identity, talking about national identities here of course, is so tied up in the European Union 
that I can't not take it personally. Yeah, but you're not leaving the European Union now. No. I am. I lose my citizenship in four hours. I know. So how are you not bothered about this? Because I'm very pragmatic and nothing is practically going to change until the end of the year, by which point we'll be in Germany and we'll be fine. But you will still not be a European citizen. That doesn't change wherever you go. It could. I'll get German citizenship at some point. No match me better than this one. Well, so I'm currently reading this, which is exactly about that, about getting German citizenship. I've already, they already know about this bill. Catch up with the vlog. I haven't watched the vlog. You haven't okay. posted it yet. <laughs> no. So uh, this, this author lived in Germany since, I think she said since the 90s. Mm -hmm. And it took her a very long time to get German citizenship. Mm -hmm. It's not an easy thing. I've been, you're, I've been an EU citizen my whole life. And it's sad to lose that. It's like... Um, taking away a right your not just a right but it's taking away your nationality it's taking away your national identity it's like um if you were no longer suddenly a citizen of your country and it wasn't your choice it was something that other people had decided for you it's that it's that kind of thing that is being taken away and that is sad and today is a day for mourning um but my identity and who I am is wrapped up in so many other things beside nationality that are important to me. That's just one one facet. Throughout my life, I think, been very deliberate to not focus on that aspect of my identity as being the one that defines me. So I've never been a, a jingoistic flag waver for anything. I ne think hang that's... on, hang on, hang on. Neither have I. No, neither. Ne no, I have never in my life waved a national flag. <laughs> never. The other fact of it is that my identity is very simple, as you say, as opposed to yours. I was just born in the UK. I've just lived in the UK my whole life, except for a couple of years in Germany. And I've never had to think about nationality as much as someone who's, I guess, moved around a lot more, come from other places. You've been an immigrant your whole life, in a sense. So you've always lived with that. And it, I guess it has more meaning to you because of it. And this is the, the root of, of Brexit in many ways, is people like me who were just born in a place, live in the place, love the place, but never really have to think about it in any way. And I would count myself among that as well. That allows me to think of myself in different terms. So jingoistic flag wave are not necessarily the right term, but because of my limited experience of culture, of, of no, of culture, culture as well. Yeah. Um, it means that there are other parts of me that are far more important. And the fact is that at the end of today, even at the end of the year, I'm still the same person. You're still the same person. It's just you're not going to be married to an EU citizen and I'm not going to be an EU citizen. And I'm not saying that doesn't suck. It absolutely does. But it doesn't change me. I think we can inject a little bit of positivity here because Brexit sucks and it's going to suck real hard for the next generation. Yes. And all the kids now, particularly who are... It's, it's worse for people who are teenagers now. Like, you have the absolute worst of it because they're not going to be able to enjoy the same rights and privileges that I've been able to enjoy. Mm -hmm. um, and will continue to enjoy because I'm just going. And I've gone and married someone from the EU, which makes it a little easier. Part of your master plan. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, funny that when we, did, when we got married, that was before the Brexit referendum. Mm -hmm. Um... I never saw the value in marriage, and I'm not afraid to say that. It's nice that we did it, but honestly, I couldn't care less about marriage. But I, the fact that you will be able to live in Germany with me is an unintended upside. Yeah, it's definitely convenient that we got married is pretty much how I see it as well, yeah. because I was far more up on marriage when we got married. Since then, I'm less fussed about marriage, no offence. <laughs> but, but just generally, like, when we got married, our lives didn't change. No. It wasn't a, a big thing. Our relationship didn't change. It's just what it is, and it always will be. But now, there is a real upside But now there it. is an upside. Um, but I'm a very pragmatic person as well, and... At the end of the day, we're going to be all right. And our quality of life in Germany is going to be much better than our quality of life in Brexit Britain. Yes. Um, and 
we have we are really lucky we are incredibly privileged and i'm i'm going to realize that and realize that's not going to be the same for everyone not even everyone watching this probably but if you will allow me i would quite like i would like to enjoy that and allow that to to lift me up a little bit because i have the privilege of being married to claudia and being able to run away and let yeah. me live somewhere good no the ability to have freedom of movement is a privilege and i cannot understand why the hell you'd want to give that up it's it's people who've never used it it's people like me who haven't had that that cultural infusion um i have a little bit because of, but, but <laughs> because, because of, of you but certainly not to the degree that people in mainland europe have grown up with um but then to it's it's again it's sad for the teenagers and younger because they have to some degree grown up with it yes um like erasmus is a bigger thing than it than it used to be um, and it's going to finish people young people are more likely now to than they've ever been to look at their opportunities abroad not just in the uk and with the growth of the internet as well just are becoming more more internationally minded and and less sort of insular in their own country so it it sucks for them and i'm sad for them but again the way that i'm coping with this the way that i'm choosing to cope with this is to say that i'm okay okay and if you want some positivity mm -hmm. there is a bigger pro eu pro international pro immigration pro integration movement in the uk now than there has ever been in my lifetime because my whole life i've grown up with politicians competing to see who can uh, cut the most immigration and that's always been the argument immigration has always been bad it's never been considered good but we have a huge pro-eu movement in this country now and brexit is temporary well i hope they can make a difference so shall we end the video on this positive note and waving minerva into the camera <laughs> Since she's decided to show up as well. Hello, there you go. You'll be a German kitty soon. Yeah, I'm just really worried that she's a Welsh nationalist and she's going to be really She angry. is probably a Welsh nationalist, isn't you she? You for Brexit, wouldn't you? Years you would Hang on, I remember the Welsh nationalists didn't actually want Brexit. Oh, that's true. <laughs> Minerva, anyway. Minerva. Minerva, don't mind. To a positive future. Yeah. Um, you'd better believe that Brexit is temporary. There's no way. Is there Minerva? There's no way that the UK is going to um, stay out of the EU forever. And we're just going to wait it out. And in the meantime, that pro-Remain movement isn't going to stop and isn't going to slow down. It's going to focus on other things. It's going to focus on limiting the impact of Brexit on poor people. And I would implore you Remainers to think local and what you can do to look after the people that are around you at this time and continue to make the argument the youth are behind you okay um, that you are the yeah. youth and that's that's what's going to happen um i don't think that the this where we are now at this point in time is as brexity as the uk is ever going to be it's only going to get more positive about the eu I really hope you're right. This is like the fifth time I've tried to finish this video now. It's already very long. <laughs> so on this positive note, thank you for watching. Bye. Auf Wiedersehen. Jeez. Never said that in a video. <laughs> <laughs>